Good afternoon and praise the Lord. It is 3 o'clock Central Standard Time here in Dallas, Texas, and we greet you warmly this afternoon, both literally and figuratively, in Jesus' name. I want to apologize uh, for anyone who may be trying to follow us right now on uh, YouTube. Again, I, you know, we cannot for the life of us figure out what's going on. We've been in touch with our um, internet provider here at the house, and uh, we've had our signal separated into two different channels, and we've done all kinds of things trying to accommodate uh a better broadcast you know so we're not interrupted and we don't have so many issues well for some reason today it appears to be overcast uh, skies outside and for some reason today we cannot get uh, our computer to stay connected to our internet signal we cannot for the life of us uh, get other hotspot devices that we, I actually have a hotspot device that we used for years at our church location. If the internet ever went down or anything, we were able to use this hotspot device as a backup and it worked beautifully. We had no issues uh, trying to use it here at the house. It does not want to work, cannot connect to it for the love of God. And then uh, Tommy, you know, has his phone that he'll often use as a backup. Excuse me one second here. He has his phone, which he uses as a backup as well for uh, emergencies and what have you. I have devices that I'm able to use as a backup. My phones and none of them are connecting to our computer this afternoon. So uh, Tommy is trying real hard to get everything connected. And if it does connect, hopefully he'll let me know that we're connected and we're on our YouTube as we're supposed to be. How are we doing so far? I think the software wants to update now. Oh, you got to be kidding me. And then we have software that we use for our live broadcasts. And apparently right now, from what Tommy tells me, the software is wanting to update. So, it's just going to be one of those days. Amen. I have an important message for the church today. I believe it will be a blessing and a help to you. I hope it will be. Uh, but if you're just tuning in, I'll repeat real quickly. We are having trouble with our internet today. And our computer that we use for our broadcast on uh, YouTube is not able to connect to any internet provider. Our, our uh, computer that we use for our YouTube is not connecting to any of our internet uh, devices and our internet so we're having trouble with our youtube but if you'll hang in there with us we will uh, be on youtube as soon as we're able in the meantime i have started the facebook live that way we uh, are assured that at least we've started on time and we are online so anyway we're going to go ahead then and try and, and get started this afternoon. I don't like to be late, and uh, I don't respond well to things not going the way they're supposed to be going. Uh, I have a little bit of a perfectionist streak in me, and it drives me up the wall when things don't work the way that they're meant to work. So uh, hopefully folks on YouTube will simply switch over to Facebook and they'll be able to at least see us here. All right, we want to start our service this afternoon with a word of prayer. I want to uh, mention a very special prayer request. 
We have a lady who is very special to this ministry. She and her husband, Scott, live in uh, Austin, Texas. They have been part of our ministry, albeit long distance, for a number of years now. And uh, she and Scott love our church. They love our ministry. They have supported it uh, financially when they were able. And uh, she has been going through, Cynthia has been going through some really difficult physical uh, times in the last several years. For those of you who think that uh, certain sports and uh, athletic endeavors, you know, are so wonderful, Cynthia was a gymnast as a young person. And she's a very tiny, petite woman. And she was a gymnast. Well, she explained to me that the years of uh, her gymnast activity took a toll on, its, on her body as it does on all people who are uh, in that endeavor. And it literally has just destroyed her body. She has terrible back issues. Uh, I do not mean minor, I mean major. She has had to have a number of her vertebrae in her spine. Um, she's had to have them uh, surgically, I forget the word they use now, fused. And uh, she's had a number of surgeries. She's in constant pain, has been for years. And this poor woman has struggled and suffered for many, many years. And Cynthia uh, is going in for an extremely, extremely invasive surgery on the 20th of September. So it's three weeks from tomorrow. And they literally, in order to do this surgery, she explained it to me, they literally have to take some of her internal organs and literally kind of take them out of her body and set them off to the side, so to speak. Now, I don't mean that they disconnect them and all that. I'm not, I don't believe they do all that. But they, they have to literally take them out. They cannot work around them. They have to remove them from her body. And then they have to do the surgery on her spine where she's needing this done. Then they return the organs to their original place and what have you, and they sew her up. And she is understandably very, very anxious and nervous about this surgery. Uh, she's trusting the Lord. And I want us to remember Cynthia in prayer. I want us to remember her this Sunday, next Sunday, and the Sunday after. The 19th of September is my... 56th birthday. Thank God. He's allowed me to see 56 years. I didn't think I would see 35. So I'm going on 21 birthdays that I did not think I would ever see after my experience in uh, August, September, October of 2000. So, uh, you know, I thank God for all these years, but the 19th will be my 56th birthday, and I have already made arrangements. I will be flying down to Austin on the 19th, the evening of the 19th. It'll be after church. We're going to have church because the 19th is on Sunday and uh, of September. And then I'm going to fly down there. I'm going to be in the hospital when Cynthia is uh, brought in to check in and what have you for her surgery. I want to be able to be there to pray with her family and her husband and be a support to them. Uh, we are their church. We are their church. Uh -huh. uh, you know, there are many people around the country who count on us. Uh, they count on me as their pastor. They count on us as a church to hold them up in prayer when they need prayer, uh, to believe God with them. And I do everything in my power for folks like this who have been a long time 
member and supporter of our ministry and our church. I do everything in my power to be there for them when they need us. Amen. And uh, so I'm going to fly down on Sunday evening. I'll be staying in a uh, La Quinta there next to the hospital. And then Sunday I'll be in prayer. I don't know if I'll stay past Monday evening or not. I, you know, I've kind of left it open in the event that I need to. Uh, but I will be there at least through Monday evening. It is only about an hour or so flight from Dallas to Austin. Uh, thankfully, it is not an extremely expensive flight either. I will be renting a car when I get there. Normally, we would drive, but these days, um, because I would have to make the trip to Austin by myself, uh, I can't really do that right now. It's a five hour drive. And uh, I cannot do a five-hour drive at the moment uh, very safely without getting very, very fatigued and very tired. So I'm going to fly down on Sunday the 19th, my, my 56th birthday, in the evening after church. I will be in the hospital with Cynthia and Scott when Cindy goes in for her surgery on Monday morning. I will be praying with the family, and I'll be there with them through the day. Um, and then if all goes well and, uh, and all signs are good, I'll return on Monday evening. If I need to stay there any longer, I most certainly will. Amen. People who are a part of this ministry, you know, our ministry these days is primarily uh, Internet. We, we've had an awful hard time with local support, and uh, I've talked about this many times over the years. Uh, we've had an awful time with local support. However, we have virtual members of our church all over the country and around the world, for that matter. And uh, our videos, we are on four or five different video locations online, including our church um, YouTube channel. Uh, we have other channels on sites like Vimeo, Daily Motion, and a channel called GodTube, which is similar to YouTube, but it's strictly a Christian site. And uh, we have videos on all of these sites. And when you go through all the sites and you add up all the statistics, and all the numbers, our videos are viewed between eight and 10,000 times a month. That's a lot of views. Now that does not mean that our Sunday services are viewed eight to 10,000 times a month. Um, the videos that are viewed range from sermons from you know years past uh, we have all kinds of teaching and Bible studies that are published online. Some of our Bible study series have been extremely popular uh, on the internet. We did a Bible study series for about four months that was titled um, Paranormal 101. And that Bible study series talked about and covered all things paranormal, you know. We have a, a lot of people in our world today who are obsessed with, you know, all things paranormal. So uh, now we wanted to address these things from a biblical Christian perspective. Tommy has just informed me that I think we are finally live on YouTube. We finally got that fixed, so I think we're live on YouTube. So we wanted to address all things paranormal and supernatural from a biblical perspective, because as children of God, the Word of God is our final authority in all matters, all matters. And uh, so I wanted to be able to address these things knowing that there is such curiosity in our world today. You know, if you look on television, there are dozens of television programs 
that are devoted to ghost hunting and uh, paranormal, this sort of thing. So we wanted to address it from a Christian perspective. I did a lengthy, in-depth teaching on all things paranormal. We called it Paranormal 101. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can look at our playlists. And this Bible study series has its own playlist, Paranormal 101. And you can literally watch the entire teaching from the first session all the way through. I think there were 16 or 17 sessions, something to that effect. And you can watch the entire series. And uh, that series has been viewed thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Some of the videos in that series have been more popular than others, uh, but it's been viewed thousands of times. So again, when I say our ministry is primarily an internet ministry these days, this is what I'm talking about. You know, uh, we have people around the world who uh, wait on our services. I'm going to tell you, when our service is over, I literally take a little disc from our high def camera. I take it to my laptop and I immediately, immediately, I change my clothes and I immediately begin to edit this video to get it ready for publishing to the internet. I uh, have to publish it first to my laptop. The software that I use, you know, it requires time to publish to my laptop. That can take an hour or better. Then, after it is published to my laptop, I take it and uh, I upload it to YouTube. After I've uploaded it to our church channel on YouTube, a period of time ensues and it's available for you and uh, whoever else wishes to watch it to watch it. And then, after a period of time, YouTube then allows me to download it from YouTube uh, back to my computer and what YouTube has done their software and, and their system compresses the video so that the size that I have uploaded is reduced by about 80 or 90 percent so if the video that I create here at the at the house is let's say seven or eight gigabytes uh, when I download it from YouTube, it'll be under one gigabyte. So it reduces the amount of memory that it takes up on our computer tremendously. What I then do is I then take the compressed file that I have downloaded from YouTube and I upload that to all our other video sites. This way it uploads more quickly and more cleanly it, uh, some of the sites have size requirements so having gone through the the process at youtube and all it reduces it to a size that i can use on some of these other sites then i upload our video to these other sites and if you watch our facebook channel at all then you know that or my facebook profile i should say then you know that I then go and I publish an announcement. The video is available to watch. Here's the link. I do that for a live service video. I do that for our uh, sermon alone video in high def. Uh, I do it all over the internet, not just on uh, Facebook, but also on uh, LinkedIn and on sites like uh, well, on our YouTube channels, on Twitter, you know, all over the place. So, uh, you know, I put our videos out there. Do I do this because I think that I'm the greatest preacher in the world? Not by a long shot. Uh, I do this because I believe that God has given me the messages that I preach. That's the way we old-time Pentecostals believe. We don't just get up and preach a pretty word that we put together, you know, but we preach a message that God has laid on our heart for that moment in time for the audience that we have. And uh, 
I believe the Lord's given me the messages that I preach, and I believe it's important that as many people as possible are able to hear them. If you excuse me one second. Uh huh. Just so you're aware, it's connecting briefly to anything, but still drops. I can't get it to hold on to anything. It won't even do the update because the the service isn't holding enough for it to do the update. Okay, Booby. All right. Well, hopefully. Okay, something, I don't know what in the world happened to our Facebook. Tommy was just telling me that the YouTube broadcast is having all kinds of trouble. We, we cannot, for the life of us folks, figure out what's going on. You wouldn't believe the money we've spent to be able to do the ministry we do. It, that none of this is cheap. Um, we've spent thousands of dollars on computer equipment, cameras, you know, so on and so forth, to try to make the best possible product, if I may use that term, that we can. And, uh, you know, we just, sometimes things go on, and for the life of us, we cannot figure out what's going on. Anyway, uh, I went off on another tangent about our internet ministry, but I'm trying to tell you that this is why people who follow our ministry and support our ministry are so important to us. And Cynthia, when she has been in uh, Dallas from Austin, she uh, always comes to church, always. She came up when we did our spring fellowship conference and spent a few days with us uh, for the Spring Fellowship Conference. This lady desperately needs our prayer. Her body mm -hmm. has been destroyed by years of um, working in the field of gymnastics, and she is going through an extremely in invasive surgery on Monday the 20th. I'll be going down to Austin to be with her and her husband and family while she's in surgery. Uh, so we need to keep her in prayer for the next yes. three weeks, okay? Yes, I believe God is able to perform a miracle in her body. I believe the doctors can be confounded when they go in, and they may very well find that they're not needing to do nearly as much as they thought they needed to do, or may not need to do anything, amen? So let's be in prayer for Cynthia today uh, as we pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today, God, we come before you grateful, Lord, for this day. Thankful, God, for our salvation, for our relationship with you. Lord, if it were not for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, I cannot imagine where I would be, what my life would be. You've been an anchor and a rock, Lord, in our lives. You've helped us through some of the most difficult times that we've ever endured. And our faith in fact and in deed has been the victory that overcomes the world. Master, today we come in with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving. We come in today, God, with lips that overflow with praise and glory to your wonderful precious name. Master, this hour we also come in as the people of your house, as the sheep of your pasture. We come in today, God, with a number of needs. Oh God, we're but human, and we're not able often to do, Lord, what we're needing to do. And we need you to step in and to intervene on our behalf. And Lord, today we lift up our sister Cynthia Weishel. We ask God right now in the name of Jesus, by the power of God, by reason of the Holy Ghost, that you would reach down from heaven at this very moment, that you would touch her body. God, you're able to heal and restore and deliver all the damage, God, that's been done to her body through years of, uh, of uh, engaging in gymnastics. Master, you're able to deliver her from her pain. You're able, God, today to go and do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ever ask or think. And right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we ask God that you would touch her miraculously. 
Lord, in the name of Jesus, give her the faith, Lord, that she needs to reach out and grab hold of a miracle. Touch her mind, touch her spirit, touch her body. For your glory, not for ours, for your glory. Master, today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we also lift up Tommy at this hour. Lord, uh, he's in a situation right now that he has not been in for decades. And we're facing <coughs> many changes in the months to come. And at the moment, the air is full of uncertainty. And Lord, there's great anxiety in uncertainty. We're trying to believe you and trust you to open the right doors, Lord, to do what needs to be done. We need you, God, to open up a job for him, Lord, that is going to be sufficient to meet the needs that we have. Uh, Lord, we need you, God, today to provide a position that's going to pay and provide the benefits that uh, he, he needs, that we need. And Lord, today, if this ministry is to continue and if we are to go on, then we ask that you would sandwich with providing him a position. We would ask God that you would simultaneously point us in the direction that you would have us to go and allow us, Lord, wherever you may land us, allow us to land in a place where there will be local people who have a mind to live for God, who have a mind to worship God, who have a mind to pray, who have a mind, God, to do things the way they ought to be done. And Lord, not people who play games and not people who are non-committal, not people, Lord, who are easily and foolishly offended, but people, Lord, who have the commitment necessary to build a church, to build a ministry from the ground up that will bring you glory and honor and praise. For, Lord, you've given me a vision, not just for an internet ministry, but you've given me a vision for a church, for a ministry that reaches out to a lost and dying world in so many ways. Lord, that ministers to the homeless, that ministers to those who have been cast away, the runaway, uh, those today who have been disowned and disenfranchised by their families and by the church. You've given me a vision today, Lord, of a church that reaches out to nursing homes and prisons, that reaches out to hospitals and shut-ins. Lord, a church that is full of people of every race and every background and every nationality and skin color. Lord, a body of people that love one another in truth, not in word, but in truth and in deed. And Lord, a church that is full of the power of God and the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. That we might see revival in our city, in our nation, in our world. The church needs revival. It's in terrible, terrible shape right now. And the church of the living God needs revival. Lord, our nation needs you. Our president needs you at this hour. We ask God during this uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, so many terrible things are likely to happen. We're not surprised by these things, but we're heartbroken. Lord, when so many lose their lives at what is supposed to be the end of this skirmish and the end of this trouble. And yet there are young men and women losing their lives even at this hour. Be an encouragement. Be a comfort. Be peace today to those families who have lost loved ones. Oh God, wrap your arms around them. Let them know, Lord, that somebody somewhere is holding them up in prayer and believing God for strength and wisdom in this difficult hour. And Lord, we lift up our president and our elected leaders and we ask God that you would give him wisdom, that you'd allow him, Lord, to make uh, the right decisions that are necessary for this hour. Help us, Lord, in the end 
to walk away from this experience with a great outcome. Not a good outcome, a great outcome. We know, God, that you're able. Master, we need a move of the Holy Ghost in this service today. We ask, God, that you would move mightily. Touch not only those of us that are in this place, but those that are watching by reason of the Internet. Save the lost, reclaim the backslider, heal the sick. Deliver, God, from the oppression of the enemy. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. You know, I was thinking about it and I thought I'm probably the only Pentecostal preacher in the world that doesn't play a musical instrument. And that drives me crazy. Believe me, I feel so inadequate uh, not being able to play an instrument as so many preachers I know are able to do. Uh, but we're having to do our worship services a cappella. Otherwise, as you watch us on Facebook, you would see our mouths moving and hear no sound because Facebook mutes uh, any time music is being used. We use pre-recorded background music. Uh, we used to in our worship and they will mute uh, any song that, you know, there's some sort of a copyright claim on. Uh, even though we're not trying to use it to make money, we're not trying to use it to make a profit, we're not using it for performance, we're not recording it for, you know, any kind of distribution. But anyway, uh, so we have to do our worship service a cappella so that we can share it with you. So I invite you to worship with us right now uh, as we sing. The Word of God said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I'm glad that's all he asks. Because these days, that's about all I can do. Amen. It's different now since Jesus signed my pardon. It's different now since by his blood I'm whole. Oh, Satan had to flee when God rescued me and now. It's different, oh, so different now. It's different now since Jesus signed my pardon. It's different now since by his blood I'm whole. Oh, Satan had to flee. When God rescued me, and now it's different, oh, so different now. It's different now, since Jesus signed my pardon. It's different now. Since by his blood I'm whole, oh, Satan had to flee when God rescued me, and now it's different, oh, so different now. It's different now since Jesus signed my pardon. It's different now since by his blood I am whole. Oh, Satan had to flee when God rescued me. And now it's different. Oh, so different now. Let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold. 
bringing cheer everywhere to the sad and the lone. Let my life be a light to some soul. Oh, let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold, bringing cheer everywhere to the sand and the lone. Let my life be a light to some soul. Lord, let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold. Bringing cheer everywhere to the sand and the lone. Let my life be a light to some soul. Is that your prayer? Well, let my life be a light shining out through the night. May I help struggling ones to the fold, bringing cheer everywhere to the sad and the lone. Let my life be a light to some soul. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm staying up on the wall. I'm not coming down. Satan gets behind me. I'm giving you no ground. Gonna build what God has told me till I hear the victory sound. Staying up on the wall. I'm not coming down. Staying up on the wall, I'm not coming down. Satan gets behind me, I'm giving you no ground. Gonna build what God has told me, till I hear the victory sound. Staying up on the wall, I'm not coming down. I'm staying up on the wall, I'm not coming down. Satan gets behind me, I'm giving you no ground. Gonna build what God has told me, till I hear the victory sound. Staying up on the wall, I'm not coming down. I'm staying up on the wall, hallelujah, I'm not coming down. Satan gets behind me, I'm giving you no ground. Gonna build what God has told me, till I hear the victory sound. Staying up on the wall, I'm not coming down. I'm staying up on the wall. I'm not coming down, I'm staying up on the wall, I'm not coming down. Hallelujah, I love that chorus today, amen, means I'm committed to doing what God has called me to do, amen. And I'm not going to stop doing it until I achieve the desired end. Hallelujah. That's why I try so hard today in spite of everything to stay true to my vision and to do what God has called me to do. Amen. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. I've got those joy bells, joy bells, 
Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. I've got those joy bells. Joy bells. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Well, joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Oh, joy bells keep ringing in my soul. I've got those joy bells. Joy bells. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Well, joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Oh, joy bells keep ringing in my soul. I've got those joy bells. Joy bells. Joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Even in difficult times, joy bells keep ringing in my soul. Amen. Amen. And this is my prayer today. An old song we used to sing when I was just a kid in the Pentecostal church. Well, let the dew of heaven fall upon my thirsty soul. Oh, let the dew of heaven fall on me. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, won't you come and take control and let the dew of heaven fall on me. Oh, let the dew of heaven fall upon my thirsty soul. Oh, let the dew of heaven fall on me. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, won't you come and take control and let the dew of heaven fall on me. Oh, let the dew of heaven fall upon my thirsty soul. Oh, let the dew of heaven fall on me. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, won't you come and take control and let the dew of heaven fall on me. Hallelujah. Now we sing our hymns with some pre-recorded background music. And as we sing these uh, later, the video on Facebook may go quiet. But please just fast forward to, uh, you know, after the song, the sound will return. They just mute it when we use music sometimes. Amen. Here's an old song I love today, a glorious church. To you, hear them coming, brother, thronging up the steps of life, clad in glorious shining garments, but what's gone is pure and white. It's a glorious church. Without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb, is a glorious church. Without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Do you hear the stirring anthem, filling all the earth and sky? 
trans victorious army lifted banner up on high. Is the glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb? Is the glorious church without spot or wrinkle? For our victory is nigh. We shall join the concrete Savior. We shall reign with him on high. It's a glorious church without moderate souls. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's a glorious church. Without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Amen. It's a glorious church. And until then, hallelujah, my heart can sing. When I pause to remember the heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. So until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day, oh hallelujah, Until the day God calls me home, the things of her will dim and lose their value. Oh, if we recall their borrowed for a while, and things of her. That cause the heart to tremble. Remember, there will only bring a smile. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then. Until the day God calls me home. Until the day God calls me home. Hallelujah. Amen. Until then, my heart will go on singing. Praise the name of the Lord today. Praise the name of the Lord. I also want to mention, uh, for those of you who may remember, a great aunt of mine, an uncle who 
came and sang for us on a number of occasions uh, over the years. Travis and Dorothy Overton, uh, my uncle passed, I, I don't remember exactly how long ago it was, probably about a year or so, uh, he passed on and uh, my great aunt passed away uh, just the day before yesterday, uh, midnight, um, Saturday morning, I guess it was. So anyway, uh, you'll want to remember that family in prayer as well. And uh, they came and sang for us on a number of occasions. They were not Kenny Rogers and uh, Dolly Parton by any stretch of the imagination. But we appreciated their coming and uh, singing and being a blessing. Amen. I want to move right into the Word of God today. I've told you many times, this ministry does not beg and plead for money like other uh, ministries do. I refuse to do it. But I will tell you that uh, we need all the support we can get, especially these days with Tommy's uh, position being phased out in November. And uh, our church, we had a church space for a long time. And uh, a beautiful little space in a storefront not too far from here. And we love that space, but I felt that of the Lord to give it up and to move our services to the house. And we converted our sunroom, which is where you are with us now, into a sanctuary. And uh, it was a good thing we did that when we did, because COVID came along. And all of a sudden, we'd have been in a real pickle if we were still obligated to maintain, you know, the storefront and pay for the rent and the utilities and all that. But in God good, amen. Yes, amen. He gives us foreknowledge and forewarning and lets us know you need to change some things up. And we did, and it worked out beautifully. And uh, so uh, we have all kinds of stuff in storage. We actually have two different storage units because the church has a lot of material, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, our house is a mess because we had to combine, you know, uh, church stuff like the, for the office and everything. We had to bring it home. And uh, so if we had a church space, you know, we, we'd be able to have a place for all these things. But in the meantime, we have all kinds of stuff in two different storage spaces. We pay a few hundred dollars a month for storage. We pay for internet uh, hosting of our websites and our web ministries. There are a number of things that we pay for on a monthly basis. And we need all the help we can get because uh, Tommy and I cannot afford to carry the church. We did that for many, 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 many years. And uh, when the church was short, we made up the difference. We did that for decades, folks. And uh, we cannot afford to do that at this time. And we certainly don't want to lose everything that is in storage. If we wind up moving, if we wind up having to move to a new location, uh, we'll be able to come back and get all these things and bring it with us. And literally, we'd be able to set up a church somewhere uh, you know, lickety split as far as physically set up a church. We'd be able to do that very quickly. We've got all the materials we need. Amen. Amen. All right. We want to move right into the Word of God today. If you have your Bibles and you would join me, please, in Philippians, the third chapter. Philippians chapter 3. This is Paul's epistle. Epistle being a fancy letter for a fancy word for letter. <laughs> it is Paul's letter to the church in a city called Philippi. And therefore, the people of Philippi are known as the Philippians. This epistle, Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 8, reading through verse number 15. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 
through 15. I want to talk to us today on a very important topic. If you've been in our church for very long, you've heard me talk about this a number of times over the course of the years, but I feel instructed of the Holy Ghost to once again preach in this vein. Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 through 15 and the King James text today reads as follows. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ and be found in him, listen, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means i might attain unto the resurrection of the dead not as though i had already attained either were already perfect but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we come before you in prayer. We humble ourselves, O oh God. I humble myself, O oh God, in your presence as one that is called to this office, this ministry. I understand today, O oh God, how imperative it is that the anointing of the Holy Ghost rests upon the speaker, the man, the woman of God. Lord, nothing that I might say could be of any help or benefit to God's people today or any day outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let your spirit rest upon me. Let your spirit rest upon every word I speak. And even as it goes forth, Lord, uh, minister to the heart of the hearer. Help them to understand, O oh God, that that which they hear is indeed from the Word of God. And it is indeed today, Lord, approved of by the Holy Ghost. Anoint the speaker and the hearer, for we need you in this hour. We need to hear from heaven. We ask it today, O oh God, in none other but Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, the perfect deception. The perfect deception. From the beginning of time until this very moment, the enemy of the human soul, Satan, has sought to deceive men and women, boys and girls, human beings. He has sought to convince us and cause us to believe something that is contrary to God 
and contrary to the plan and will of God, contrary to the word of God. In the beginning, he deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, causing them to question whether or not God genuinely said, in the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Well, God meant what he said. <laughs> mm -hmm. He doesn't talk just to be heard. He means what he says in his word today. And we need to understand his word. But you know, there is so much being taught, so much being preached, so much being said and disseminated within uh, the Christian church today, my friend, that is not accurate at all. It is, in fact, a deception. It causes you to believe something contrary to what God has said and what the Lord has declared in His Word. It is amazing how much we hear from preachers' lips that has nothing in the universe to do with God, has nothing in the universe to do with the Word of God. It is crafted, it is created by human beings who manipulate and they deform and transform the Word of God until they make it appear as though the message they preach is scriptural. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Just because you preach from the Bible does not mean that what you preach is biblical. Amen. A lot of people open their Bible at the beginning of their message and they read a scripture and then they proceed to deliver a word that has nothing in the universe to do with the teaching of God's Word. I can pull any passage I want out of the Word of God, and basically, if I pull it out of context and take it alone, I can make it say anything I want it to say. The Word of God declares line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You cannot preach a message from one passage of Scripture that contradicts and stands in contradiction to other areas of God's Word. No, all of your message has to come from a total of God's Word. It has to come from the complete Word of God. It all has to come together until it is in perfect harmony. And the problem with, uh, you know, I, I used to be one of those preachers. God help me, I hate to have to admit it. But I used to be one of those preachers who could take a passage out of context and preach just about anything, you know, that come into my head. And I thought every passage in the Word of God stood alone. That, it, you know, it had its own message. Each verse and each line had a message in it. No it does not. Not by a million, million miles. The Word of God declares within the context of the law of Moses, God declared to Moses, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And that principle is then repeated in the New Testament. In other words, in order for something to be established as true, it has to have support elsewhere. Nothing stands alone by itself. Nothing. God says nothing in one place that it is not supported and it is not elsewhere endorsed by the Word of God. No. Everything has to have support. It has to have structure. I'll tell you, Satan has been in the deception business since the beginning of time. He wants us to believe something contrary to what God wants us to believe. In the instance of human beings, he 
wants us to believe today that we can be perfect and that God's desire and His plan and His will for us is that we be perfect. After all, they'll pull a scripture out of context that says, God speaking, that says, Be ye perfect even as I am perfect. Well, that's all well and good. The only problem is the word that is translated perfect in the King James is not the word that we use in modern English uh, and that we uh, define as perfect, meaning sinless or without fault or without blemish. That is not what the word in the original text means at all. In fact, the word that we see in the King James, which is translated perfect, comes from a word which literally means mature or fully grown. In other words, God is saying, grow up, be an adult, don't be a child. You know, mature for heaven's sake. How many people live their lives and they will have the mindset and the emotional makeup of a child mm -hmm. and they're in their 80s. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I just lost a family member who was in her 90s and still thought and acted and felt in many instances like a little stinking four-year-old. It was insane. I used to used to drive me crazy to try to deal with this particular family member because it's insanity that they could be as old as they are and yet still be so immature. But that is what the word perfect means. It means fully grown, established, mature. Many people in the church today have come to believe that they have attained godly perfection. This deception then leads to their behaving in any number of ways that completely conflict with true Christian living and the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, these things are seldom demonstrated by people who have bought into the lie and the deception of their own perfection. Mm -hmm. To love the sinner in spite of their sin, one must be able to honestly acknowledge, listen to me, that they themselves are not perfect. Mm. You hear me? Uh -huh. You cannot love a sinner... You cannot love a sinner in spite of their sin unless you can acknowledge that you yourself are not perfect. Right. The minute you buy into the deception that you're perfect, all of a sudden you give yourself license to look down on mm -hmm. others. You give mm -hmm. yourself license to hate others and to despise others right. and to dislike others, mm -hmm. which if you were in fact perfect, you would not do, my Lord. The most dangerous lie and the most prolific deception that is alive today within the church community is the false notion that one has achieved perfection or holiness. Many say with their mouths that they acknowledge their imperfections, but the true thought of their heart is demonstrated in the way they behave and the way they conduct themselves. Talk is cheap. If they really believed what they professed, that they were not perfect, their conduct would be entirely different. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah. The Apostle Paul said in our primary text today, in verse 13, cha uh, chapter 3 of Philippians, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't claim to have arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You can't allow your past mistakes. 
You can't allow your past sin. You can't allow your past faults and failings to hold you up. You got to forget the past. Forget yesterday and move forward. Hallelujah. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. See, I can't move forward until I forget what's behind me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've got things in my past, I'm sure many of you do as well, that if you contemplate them and think about them for too long, you'll become so depressed you want to throw yourself off a cliff. When we remember some of the foolishness we've engaged in, when we remember some of the hurt we have visited upon others, when we remember some of the foolish and idiotic ways we've reacted and responded to certain situations, it's maddening, it's sickening, it saddens us. But Paul said, I forget those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before. He said, I reach for it. He didn't say, I lay my hands on it. He said, I reach for it. Listen to me now. He said, I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark. I see the trophy up ahead and I reach for it and I push for it and I run toward it. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize. Of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. And yet Paul says, I'm not foolish enough to stand here and tell you that I have achieved. I'm not dumb enough to stand here and tell you that I have arrived. Oh, but I'm telling you, I know a lot of Christians, and I know yes, a lot yes, of preachers, yes. and I know a lot of churches that will tell you, because they wear their sleeves this long, and they wear their dresses that long, and they wear their hair this way. Oh, they've reached it, baby. They've arrived. They're there. Now I can look down on the homosexual. Now I can look down on the drunkard. Now I can look down on the drug addict. Now I can look down upon the unbeliever. Now I can look down upon that person who isn't in the church like I am. Yeah. Wrong. Mm -hmm. If you were as perfect as you claim you are, you would not even have the thought to look down upon anyone because godly perfection would cause you to love everyone. Mm -hmm. Tell it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. Paul writes that we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. He said we ought to be able to think soberly. To think soberly, one must have clear vision and a clear mind. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> when you're not sober, you don't see clearly. You don't think clearly. But when you are sober, you have clear vision and a clear mind. We must be willing to weigh ourselves against the Word of God. And we must willingly accept when there are areas in our lives which fall short. Anyone who cannot see in themselves weakness, failure, even sin, is destined for a fall. This then is the reason that Satan enjoys deceiving believers into thinking more of themselves than a sober self-examination would reveal. Understanding, accepting, and appreciating the grace of God in our lives, which compensates for our weakness, our faults, does not 
prevent us from striving to do better and be better. We must pursue perfection, although we know in truth that outside of the rapture and the resurrection of the body, we will never attain it fully in this life. Doesn't mean I can't try to be the best I can be. That's right. But at the same time, I know I'm never going to be the best I can be. I'm only going to be the best I can be at the moment. Hello now. I can strive to become a better cook, studying, educating myself, practicing my skills. All the while, Tommy, I know that I'll not likely ever become a Chef Wolfgang Puck. But just because I may never become one of the world's most premier chefs, I should not be slack in my efforts to be the best cook that I can be. Right. And who knows? I may one day actually be as great a chef as Wolfgang. But I pursue daily to be better at my craft, to do better at my skill. I do not pursue daily to be as skilled as the world-renowned chef himself. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? In Hebrews 12, 14 through 16, those of you watching, those of you familiar with the Pentecostal holiness movement, this passage, of course, is highly familiar to you. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Many have been false led to believe, listen to me, that they can possess holiness or perfection in this life through the misuse and the misinterpretation of Hebrews 12 and 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Paul is literally saying to the Hebrew church that there are two things you ought to pursue or follow. What are those two things? One, Peace with all men. What's the other? Holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. What must you do in order to see the Lord? You must be in pursuit of peace with all men. You must be in pursuit of holiness. It doesn't mean you have to be in possession of either or both. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. All right. It means that you must be in pursuit of of both. Paul said, I have not yet apprehended. I haven't laid my hands on it. But I reach for it and I press forward toward the goal. Hallelujah. The term follow in the Greek is dioko. To run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing. To run after. To press on. Figuratively of one who in a race runs swiftly to reach the goal. Therefore, Paul is saying that we ought to run after, we ought to strive for peace with all men and holiness. There are people who live their lives and could care less about being at peace with other men. There are people who live their lives and could care less about living a godly, holy life. Paul said, no, 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 no. If you're going to see the Lord, you've got to at least be in pursuit of these two things. Right. Mm -hmm. These have to be two things that are always in your radar. These have to be two things that are always in your vision that you're always pursuing. Hello now. I know when I lose my temper, when I get aggravated with people, when I have a bad reaction to something that someone says or does, and I chew them out, you know, and I... 
reading the right act, I walk away. And most often I feel terrible, I feel miserable because I'm not, at that moment, I'm not following peace with all men. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And I'm disturbed and I'm disappointed by the fact that I allowed my goal, my desire to be at peace with all men. I allowed it to slip away from me. But God says that's all right as long as you're in pursuit of it. Hello now. Doesn't mean you have to lay hold of it every time. It just means you've got to pursue it. You've got to run swiftly after it. Most people today will gladly acknowledge that it is not possible to be at peace with every human being. On the planet, there's always someone somewhere who is going to be at odds with us. They're going to be offended by us, so they're going to be angry with us. The Lord had enemies in spite of the fact he went about doing good and never did anyone dirty or treated anyone unkind or maliciously. He still had enemies. Does that mean he failed in his pursuit of peace with all men? No, because the enemies that was on them, it wasn't on him. Am I telling the truth right. now? Mm -hmm. Same thing with us. There would be people who want to have trouble with me, want to have a problem with me. i got news for you, honey. It's on you. It's not on me because I'm not running around being malicious and mean-spirited. I'm not running around talking dirty about you or trying to do you uh, bad or wrong. It's on you. Yet these same people will falsely embrace the notion that holiness or perfection is somehow attainable. Yet the passage that we've just read does not tell us to attain it or to possess holiness or perfection, but rather it tells us that we must follow, we must run after, pursue both Peace with all men and holiness. These two things ought to be our goal as children of God. In spite of the fact that we know full and well they will not be attainable until the Lord has redeemed his people and transformed us into his likeness. But if we do not even pursue these things... We have no hope of ever seeing the Lord, which is the ultimate goal of all believers. Mm -hmm. As I recently preached, if you remember, from this very pulpit. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, the Apostle Paul writes also to the church at Philippi, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul states here that God's people should Look upon one another as being better than themselves. I'm going to tell you, when I look around the Riverside Church of God, when I was at Riverside, honey, there wasn't a person in that church that I couldn't honestly say I felt like was a better believer than I was, that lived this thing better than I did. I held everyone around me. I do this in about every church I've ever been part of. I hold people around me in the highest esteem. I look up to them. I admire them. I appreciate them. I, I, I'm not looking for faults and failures. 
And when I do see them, I have a bad habit or a good habit, one, of explaining them away. Because I don't want to see faults and I don't want to see weaknesses or failures in my fellow believer. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. Paul states that we ought to look at one another as being better than ourselves. This is not a matter of self-deprecation, but rather it is an issue of appreciation of others. As we exalt those about us, we maintain within ourselves a much needed sense of humility. The people of God are to possess the mind of Christ. The Lord God himself, as God, understood that he could come to earth as God. But if his purpose was to be served, it was necessary that he manifest himself in a more lowly and humble fashion, which he was willing to do for the purpose of bringing salvation. Humility is not optional for believers. It is essential. Mm -hmm. The opposite of humility is pride. And pride precedes a fall and destruction. A humble heart, even if it were perfect, would never claim to be perfect. Perfection itself would include and encompass humility. And therefore, a perfect man would refuse to declare or acknowledge himself as perfect. <laughs> there were some folks from the Riverside Church of God. There were so many people there that I just did. Oh, I, I, honestly, I'm not even joking when I say everybody in the church, as far as I was concerned, knew how to live this life better than I did. I, I love the people of that church so much. But there was one couple brother and sister king tommy met them some years back they since have gone on to their reward brother and sister king i'm gonna tell you two of the sweetest most godly human beings i've ever met in my life i i i i wish i could be like them like brother and sister Gillum, they were just the most loving, compassionate, sweetest people. You couldn't, I don't think you could get a, a negative word come out of their mouths if you put it in there and pulled it out with a string. You just couldn't get, they, they wouldn't say nothing bad about nobody, no way. Just the sweetest people. And I admired and respected brother and sister King so much. Uh, every bit as much as I admired, and y'all know what a big fan I was of Brother and Sister Gillum. Tommy and I went years ago, we went to a baby shower affair being held for my cousin. And the Kings happened to be her grandparents because her mother married one of their sons. My cousin married one of their sons. And they were at this gathering as well and I had an opportunity to talk with them for a while and I told them I said you know folks I, said, I just want to tell you I said I have always always felt that you folks are just top drawer you're, you're top shelf they don't make them any better than y'all and, and God knows my heart I meant that compliment as it couldn't have been any more sincere coming out of me for nothing. I meant every word I said to them that day. And Brother King and Sister King were standing there and they smiled. And Brother King looked at me and he said, Chuck, he said, we've always thought you were top shelf too. Boy, I'm going to tell you, that was a high compliment coming from them. But you see... There was somebody who didn't think they were perfect. There was somebody who was able to look at others in the church and see them as being better even than themselves. Do you follow what I'm saying? These are people who 
you could elevate them all you wanted to. You could compliment them all you wanted to. But honey, they just turned around and thought as highly of you and elevated you as, as highly as you did them. You follow what I'm telling you? Boy, you won't talk about as close to perfect as you can get. Well, sweetie, but you know what? If, if, if you watch the way they live and you watch the way they act and you watch the way they talk, these people never acted like people who thought they were perfect. Do you follow what I'm telling you? They never, they didn't look down on anybody. They didn't criticize anybody. They didn't find fault with anybody. No, a humble heart, even a perfect heart, would never claim perfection. In James chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, the apostle, excuse me, the brother of Jesus, James, writes, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? In other words, it desires or it wants to envy or be jealous. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Envy is born of pride. A proud individual will envy what others have, as he or she feels, quote, less than their neighbor. My goodness. By reason of the fact they don't have what their neighbor does have. A humble heart does not envy. Humility is satisfied where it is at with what it already has. This humility is our greatest defense against the sin of envy. Friendship with the world, a term that literally we, we use the word worldliness, is manifested in our spirit by the desire to have in this world what others have. Not understanding how it is that they can have something we do not. The feeling that we are equally as worthy or deserving of that which our neighbor possesses is not a godly attribute. Hmm. My goodness, a humble heart acknowledges that God is in control of our lives and that he allows or gives us that which we need, that which we require, that which we are capable of possessing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God doesn't give us certain things because if he did, he knows you'd squatter it away, you'd fritter it away, you'd lose it, you'd mess it up. If he chooses not to allow us the same pleasure or advantage as another, we ought humbly to accept this as his will and neither envy our neighbor or resent the Lord our God. I've had to sit back for years and work my tail to the bone trying to do a work for the Lord. I've Now, when I was in the mainstream before I came out in 1989, before I started affirming ministry in 1993, I used to be able to go into a community and start a church. And I mean to tell you, within a matter of months, we had 40, 50, 100 people. I've been in affirming ministry now for almost 30 years. Almost 30 years. It's hard for me to even fathom. And I can't get past the starting line. I literally cannot get past the starting line, folks. Every time I make two steps forward without fail, it feels like we go 10 steps back. 
Can't get people to be part of the church. Can't get them to be faithful. Can't get them to be committed. Can't get them to love their pastor. Can't get them. Uh, I remember pastor in my first church, my overseer, Brother G.J. Chandler, in the Church of God, Brother Chandler told me one time, he said, Brother Morrow, he said, man, I'm going to tell you something, son. I was 19 years old at the time. He said, I'm going to tell you something, son. He said, I've never seen a church in my life that loved their pastor more than your people love you. He said, I've never seen. He said, your people adore you. They absolutely. I'm going to tell you something. You get a church full of people that love their pastor, and I'm going to tell you, you're able to get some things done. When I resigned that church and left, and it was because I, I had the gay issue inside me, and I was struggling with it, and I was terrified I might one day, might one day do something stupid, and I didn't want to destroy the good work that I had begun. So I thought maybe it'd be a good idea for me to evangelize a while and not be in pastoral ministry for a while until I could find a wife, because that'll fix me, that'll make everything right, you know. Something magical about women, you know. They can fix a gay man in a flat second. Just something magical about it. So I resigned my first church, you know. And uh, figured I'd move into a different type of ministry and that would be better. I wouldn't risk as much. Well, you know, the funny thing is, my grandmother, she was upset that I, that I resigned my first church. She didn't know the issues that I had. And she knew how quickly it had grown and how much it had prospered. And we had an incredible move of God in that church, like you wouldn't believe. And I promise you, it was in spite of my imperfection. It was in spite of the confusion in my life and, you know, the stuff going on in my head. You know why? Because God is God and God right. is good. That's it right. wasn't about me. It was about Him. Amen. Yes, amen. I wasn't doing what I was doing for me. I was doing it for Him. And I'm telling you, God's good. But I'm going to tell you, Grandma Bell, bless her heart, she got teary-eyed and said, Oh, you know, you're leaving because the people never shared your vision. And I looked at her and I said, Grandma... That couldn't be further from the truth. I said, that, that doesn't have nothing to do. That doesn't have nothing to do with me resigning. My people, the people of this church have always had my back. They've always loved me. They've always shared my vision. That is not the issue. But see, you know, that was her thought process. But you know what? Now I've been in affirming ministry for almost three decades and I watch other affirming churches, and, and most affirming churches struggle like we do. I've been in this line of ministry now, as I say, for almost 30 years. I have watched dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of affirming churches open and close since I've been in this line of ministry. Y'all say, well, now you're preaching to... No audience, and all you've got is those of us watching on the internet. Yeah, but I've got that. i got news for you, honey. I could point you to dozens and dozens and dozens of preachers I know who are driving truck now, who are working in retail now, who are doing everything but ministry because they tried to do a work that was affirming of LGBT people and they went through the same struggle I go through and they quit. They couldn't take it. They gave up. They said, I'm tired of this. I don't understand. This church over here has a hundred people and this church over here has a couple hundred people. And there aren't very many affirming churches that have this, but there are a few. And they looked at that, Tommy, and they said, well, I don't understand why I can't have it. I don't understand why our church can't be like that. And have I been through moments of pity party like this? Yes, I have. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. But in the end, I think I can honestly say, and I think Tommy could, could verify that I have said on how many, how many occasions, but God knows what I can handle. God knows what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. I don't understand why we don't have hundreds of people. I don't understand why we don't have a church full of people. I don't understand why things aren't different. 
But I'm not jealous or envious of others. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I have to maintain a godly humility and I have to acknowledge that if, if I believe God's in charge of my life and my ministry, then there's a reason why we're doing exactly what we're doing right now. I don't, may not know that reason, but my knowing it is not a prerequisite. My submitting myself to it is. I've got to be humble enough to accept when conditions and circumstances are less than I'd like them to be. Does it thrill me? Not in the least. <laughs> does my self-esteem go through some battles? Oh, yes, it does. But Paul said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, meaning self-glorification. That's what vain glory means. First Peter 5 verses 5 through 7, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Once again, we hear Peter saying the identical same words as James in James 4 and 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The Lord cannot and does not work with the proud. In fact, pride puts us in opposition to God, my Lord. If we are to experience all that the Lord desires for us, we must find a place of humility and submission. Anyone with a basic knowledge of Christian theology understands that Satan fell in response to pride. Mm -hmm. He was not happy to be in service of the Lord in the most unique and powerful position in all of creation. But he had it in his heart to literally usurp God so that he might sit in the throne of God and be worshipped as the creator and not merely a creation. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, we read, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you, once, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now listen, I'm, my last page of notes here. This is some important stuff you need to understand as we reach the end of this age. The Antichrist is literally the physical embodiment of Lucifer's deepest desires. Did you hear what I just said? The Antichrist will be the physical embodiment of Lucifer, Satan's deepest desires. First, uh, Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, the Word of God said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, 
the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So you see, the Antichrist is literally going to do in physical form what Satan was talking and thinking about doing prior to the fall. In Ezekiel 28, 1 through 10, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, this is speaking literally of Satan, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, meaning you're created. You're not the creator, you're created, and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic business, hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up. Because of thy riches. Therefore thus saith the Lord. Because thou hast set thine heart. As the heart of God. Behold therefore I, I will bring strangers upon thee. The terrible of the nations. And they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. And they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit. And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? He said, are you going to stand there and tell the people who are killing you that you're God? But thou shalt be a man and no God. This is referring to the Antichrist, the physical embodiment of Satan. In the hand of him that slayeth thee, thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. In his fervor to be as God, Satan will manifest himself in human form, even as God manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he is called the Antichrist. As it's not being against Christ, it literally means a counterfeit Christ. And it is in that human form that he shall be crushed and defeated, as well as all who submit to him and worship him as God. If ever a cautionary tale existed, which should direct us away from pride and encourage us to humility, it is this tale. Mm -hmm. Satan saw himself as perfect. He could see nor find any fault whatsoever. But in that perception was the seed of his fall. Pride is the source of the perception of perfection. If you perceive any holiness or any perfection in yourself, honey, then the source of that perception and that deception is pride. Mm -hmm. Pride is the greatest curse known to fallen man. There is nothing which has given way to or created more evil, more sin and destruction in our world than the sin of pride. If we are to successfully live for the Lord and realize the fullness of the blessing he has for us in this life, if we have any hope of seeing him in that home called heaven, we must be certain to purge ourselves of the perception of perfection. The Apostle Paul declared in Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, a man who wrote 
two-thirds in the New Testament. And he says, Oh, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 57, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, I don't count myself as having apprehended. I don't consider myself as having arrived. I don't consider myself perfect as though somehow I had laid hold on that which I pursue. He said, but I keep running. I keep pursuing it. I keep chasing it. Follow peace with all men and holiness. I keep running. I keep running. It's about running the race in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. Paul writes, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. This literally means that ye may finish. How many people, I just saw a comedian the other day on television talking about running in the New York City Marathon. He said, did you win? He asked people. They said, oh, I ran in the marathon. I said, did you win? Well, no, I didn't win. He said, well, why'd you bother running? Because there is accomplishment and achievement in simply running the race. Am I telling the right. truth? Somebody else got the prize, but you ran in the marathon. How many people never even bothered to try to run a 26-mile marathon? Do you follow what I'm saying? Paul said, Know ye not that they that run in the race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Run to finish. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. People that run in races in this life run to attain a corruptible crown. But we and incorruptible. At the end of his life, and I'm closing my message right now, at the end of his life, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to Timothy, his son in the Lord, his apprentice as it were, his young charge. The Apostle Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Talk about running. Said I finished the course. Did I win the race? No, but I finished the course. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I kept going after my goal. I kept going. I kept going till I hit that finish line. But listen, he said, I have kept the faith. What is the ultimate goal of God's people? What is the ultimate goal of a child of God? Is it perfection? No. It's keeping the faith. Right. A lot of people are losing their faith today. A lot of people are giving up on their faith in God. A lot of people are walking away from the Christian faith today, especially after the debacle that is Donald Trump and the way the church has fallen at his feet and worshipped him. I read an article just today or yesterday on the internet about uh, people are falling out of the church by the thousands right now because of what transpired between the evangelical church and the Trump cult. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I didn't finish your course. I didn't finish your race. I didn't run your journey. I finished my course. 
and I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Paul said they run for a crown that passes away. We run for a crown that doesn't pass away. What is that crown? A crown of righteousness. God is going to crown us with righteousness. God is going to crown us with holiness. God is going to crown us with perfection. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Satan is a deceiver. Biggest deception that he is using against God's people today is the deception of perfection. Making people believe they can be perfect. And that that is what God expects of them. In complete contrast to that, remember Jesus who for 40 days was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. He didn't tempt the Lord with the notion of perfection. No, 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 no. <laughs> he knew who he was dealing with. He tempted him the area of pride. He thought the same thing that brought him down could bring Jesus down. If you're who you say you are, you should be able to do this. I can give you all these kingdoms. I can give you all this. Do you see? It was pride. Pride. If you're, if you're who you say you are, then you should be able to talk to this stone and turn it to bread. Pride. The Lord looked at him and said, I ain't got nothing to prove to you. have to prove nothing to you. I, you know good and well who I am, and I'd be an idiot if I sat here and felt like I had to prove myself to you when I know good and well. You believe there's one God, the Word of God said, even the demons believe and tremble. The devil knew who Jesus was. He didn't have to prove himself to the devil. Hello now. But instead, the Lord kept referring back to the Word of God, kept referring back to the Word of God, kept quoting the Word of God. Children, I want to tell you today, the perfect deception that is destroying God's church and destroying God's people today is the deception that you can be, that you should be, that you must be perfect. Mm -hmm. now, just got to run the race. You got to be running in that direction. You got to be running with that hope in your heart. You got to be running with that expectation that one day I will be perfected. Hello, now. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The perfect deception. Would you stand with me this afternoon? I'm so used to saying that at the end of church services, I still say it. <laughs> Amen. And on the video, I always, uh, when I edit the video, you know, to put it online, I always end the video when I say the words, would you stand with me? So it's kind of like a code. Amen. I hope this message has been a blessing to you today. I hope that it's encouraged you and helped you to understand that if you feel pressure to be perfect and if you feel like you can't live up to God's expectation of you and you cannot live up to what God requires of you the truth today is God doesn't require or expect what you think he expects and requires mm -hmm. and that should take the pressure off all he wants you to do is keep the faith because guess what honey your perfection and your holiness and your righteousness in the sight of God is by faith hallelujah so when you continue to walk by faith and lean on God's grace and trust Him and believe this gospel and walk in relationship with Him, He's looking at you as though you already are perfect. You already are holy. holy. You already are everything that He one day is going to cause you and I to be. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer today? Father, in the name of Jesus, once again, Lord, 
we come boldly before the throne of grace. As the word of God declares, it's our privilege as children of God. Lord, we're grateful for the word of God today. And we understand according to your word, Lord, that you've called us to a place of humility, not a place of perfection. You've called us, Lord, to strive to be better, to do better, to live better, to be a better witness and a testimony in a lost and dying world. But you do not have unrealistic expectations of us. You know, Lord, that we cannot be all that you would desire for us to be. And that is why we will go through a transformation after death, after the resurrection, the rapture of the church. We will go through a transformation. We will all be changed, living and dead. All will be changed. Why? Because, God, we can't get into your heaven as we are today. There has to be a change, a transformation. But we can secure our place in the rapture. We can secure our place in the resurrection of the righteous. If we will embrace the righteousness of God, which is by faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I don't expect one day to stand before you and see you as you are because of anything I've done or anything I've been. But rather, I will stand before you and be able to look upon you as God because of what you did for me and what you've done for us. Help this message, O oh God, to find its way into the heart of every hearer. Help us to understand it, to embrace it, to walk in it, to appreciate your grace more, to celebrate your mercy and your love. And Lord, we strive toward the mark, toward the prize. Because Lord, that is what we look forward to more than anything in this world. We look forward to one day being like you. Oh, Master, today, let this word go with us. Let it resonate in our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's an old chorus that says, To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. All I am. Is to be like Him all through life's journey from earth to glory. Is to be like him, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask is to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, all I ask is to be like Him. Amen. God bless you this afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today for a time of worship in the Word. I apologize for our long uh, 
you know, delay in our startup today because of technical issues. We appreciate your patience. I hope this service was a blessing and an encouragement to you. Feel free to leave your comments if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. We always appreciate hearing from folks who have been with us in service. I hope you'll come back and join us next Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for a time of worship and the word. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer. Mm -hmm.